I was told that you guys have been talking about service. And actually, when I agreed to speak a few weeks ago, I'd just gotten back from a trip to Haiti. So I have some friends that moved down there about nine months ago, and they're just doing some really awesome things down there. And I could probably spend the next 15 minutes just talking to you about the things that they're doing. But instead, I wanted to spend the time that I have with you today and just share with you a little bit about what God taught me, um, or I guess reminded me about when I was down in Haiti, and that is about the gift that comes in serving. I think a lot of the times when we think about service, we think about all of the things that we can do for other people. Um, we think about how we can sacrifice our time, our energy, our money, so that we can communicate to other people that I see you and that you matter, right? And of course, the hope is that by us doing that, that we can be this very real demonstration for people that God sees them and that God thinks that they matter too. And that's really important. That stuff is really, really good. Service is this kind of amazing way that we can take all of these things that we've learned about God and that we've learned about who he is, and we can take them and we can turn it into something tangible so that we can share it with the world, something that other people can actually see and touch. Service is when we get to take what we know and have learned about God's heart and actually do something with it, right? So how many of you guys play sports or have played a sport before? Hands up. Nice, we've got a lot of people that play sports in here. So when you're playing a sport, right, the first thing that you have to do is you have to learn how the game works. You have to understand the concept of the game, right? And then you go to practice and you go over the same drills and plays over and over and over and over again, right? Until it just kind of becomes something that you can do naturally. It just becomes part of who you are as a player. And then finally, after all of that, you get to hit the field and you get to play the game, right? I kind of think of service as that moment when we get to hit the field with our faith. It's when we get to take the things that we've come to understand about God, the things that we've been trying to practice in our own life, and we get to take them and we get to do something with it. When I was in high school, I played field hockey, and I was actually on a team that was pretty good. So each year we typically made it into districts and into states. But what was even more fun and even better than all of the titles and the championships and getting to go to those things was honestly just getting to play the game that we loved together. And it was cool because we realized that we got to be part of something bigger than ourselves by being on that team. And it made it really special. And I think that that's kind of what God taught me about service again when I was in Haiti this time. You see, sometimes we can get so caught up in what we're doing for other people when we serve that we miss out on seeing the gift that God is inviting us into. So today I'm going to have us kind of relook at a story that you have probably heard a hundred times. It's when Jesus feeds the 5,000 people out of five loaves of bread and two fish. And it's this really amazing story, right? And that's kind of the part that we tend to focus on a lot is this miraculous thing that God does. Because, I mean, really, let's give credit where credit is due, right? Feeding 5,000 people out of five loaves of bread and two fish, it's a pretty big deal. It's kind of impressive, right? In fact, it's not actually impressive. It's not possible. And that's what makes it so amazing. It's a miracle. You see, these stories of miracles, they're in the Bible because they're meant to blow our minds. They're meant to show us that we have this God that's able to take impossible things and make a way and make them possible again. But I think that there's something else that we can learn from this story, too. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this story to you guys. And what I want you to do is I want you just to imagine what's happening in your minds, okay? But instead of paying attention just to what's happening with Jesus in this story, I want you to picture what's happening with the disciples, okay? I want you to try to put yourself in their shoes and just imagine what they would have been feeling and what they would have been thinking at the time. Okay, so this is Matthew 14, and it's verses uh, 15 to 21. It says, When it was evening, the disciples came to him, and they said, This is a deserted place, and the hour is now late. Send the crowds away, so they may go into the villages and buy food for themselves. Jesus said to them, They need not go away. You give them something to eat. They replied, We have nothing here but five loaves and two fish. And he said, Bring them here to me. 
Then he ordered the crowds to sit down on the grass. Taking the five loaves and the two fish, he looked up to heaven and blessed them and broke the, broke the loaves and gave them to the disciples. And the disciples gave them to the crowds. And all ate and were filled. And they took up what was left over of the broken pieces, twelve baskets full. And those who ate were about 5,000 men besides women and children. So can you imagine what it would have been like to be a disciple that day? Okay, so you're standing there, right? And you're looking out over this huge crowd of people. It says that there were 5,000 people there, but that was actually just the men. So it could have been three times that size. We don't know. But the point is that it's a really big crowd of people, right? So you're looking out over this crowd of people, and then you turn, and you look at the food that's available to you, and you see five loaves of bread and two fish. Right? And you're standing there, and you're kind of doing the math in your head. And, and it's not really hard math, right? Any of us can do that. And you come to the conclusion that we don't have enough here to feed these people. So they're going to have to go somewhere else to find food. right? Except when you take this brilliant conclusion that you've come to, to Jesus, he looks at you and he says, you feed them. Can you imagine what that would have been like? I mean, I feel like I would have been like just staring at Jesus and been kind of pulling one of these like, looking out over the crowd, looking back to my food, <laughs> double checking my math, just to like look back at Jesus and be like, excuse me, <laughs> I'm supposed to do what? You know, the, Jesus, the disciples must have just been looking at Jesus like he was speaking a different language to them. You see, but I think that there's something really important that happens in this interaction that we see between Jesus and the disciples. Because the disciples have taken note of the impossibility of the situation that's before them, right? And they've brought it to Jesus' attention. And instead of just taking over and telling the disciples to step aside, instead, Jesus makes a way for the impossible to become possible. And then he literally puts it right back into their hands. It specifically says that Jesus gave the loaves and the fishes to the disciples, and the disciples went, and they passed out the bread to the people. And can you imagine what it would have been like? Jesus gives you this half a loaf of bread, okay? And he puts it in your basket, and you're going, and he says, go feed all of those people, okay? A little bit overwhelming. But you're going, and you're passing out bread, 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 and somehow the bread just keeps going, <laughs> Right? Until you finally find that all of the people have been fed. And you make your way back up to Jesus, and there's still food left in your basket. I mean, that would have been really amazing, right? But why do you think that he did that? Why do you think Jesus specifically gave the food to the disciples to pass out to the people? You see, I think it's because Jesus didn't just want the disciples to know about him. He didn't even just want them to see what he was capable of doing. Jesus wanted the disciples to experience what Jesus could do in the world. You see, I don't think that God made us just to know things about him. He didn't make us just so that we could talk about him. He wants us to carry his mission into the world. And service, it's our opportunity not just to take that mission into the world, but we get to see it come to life. And we get to see that come to life for other people, but we also get to see it come to life right before our very eyes. It's the chance that we get to see things happen in the world that other people don't get to see. You see, the disciples, they demonstrated service that day, right, by feeding this huge crowd of people and taking care of them. And they met these people's needs and these people's needs on God's behalf, and they were a gift to those people that day because of it. But at the very same time that they were being a gift to other people, they were also receiving a gift because they had the opportunity to see firsthand that God was making a difference in the world. And they got to share in this one of a kind of experience with Him. You see, God has this mission right? To bring restoration into the world. And we see that mission echoed throughout all of the stories of the Bible. And so in Genesis, we watch as this perfect world that God created gets broken, right? And the people in God's world gets broken too. And from that moment on, from Genesis on, God sets off on this mission to rescue his people. And it's that theme that ties together the story of Abraham, 
to the story of Moses, to the story of King David, to the story of Jesus, to the story of the disciples, to the story of me and you today. That theme of God coming to rescue and restore the world is what gives all of those stories a cohesive meaning. And what's really cool is that God has chosen to work alongside people to bring that mission into the world since the beginning. And his calling for us to serve other people, it's our opportunity to be part of that mission. And just like every other Bible character that came before us, other than Jesus, right? We'll make mistakes as we try to carry that mission out. So Abraham lied, Moses was a murderer, David committed adultery. I mean, Peter denied even knowing Jesus, right? But Abraham also left everything that he had to follow God and he brought his family with him. And Moses led this entire nation out of slavery so that they could worship God. And David became one of Israel's greatest kings. And Peter became this really awesome leader for the church. You see, God used these people in their imperfect service to be part of his mission to restore the world. Not because they were perfect, but because they were willing to step into what he was doing. And as a result, they got to experience God in really special ways. They got to see things that no one else got to see. And they got to be part of something that was bigger than themselves. Now, I'm not saying that when we serve other people, we should be doing it so that we can feel good about ourselves or feel like we're part of something important. But what I am suggesting is that when we're serving, we should keep our eyes open as we're doing it. Because when within our service to other people, God also is offering us a gift. He allows us to see him work in really special ways. Imagine what the disciples would have said about Jesus after that day. Can you imagine how your world would have been rocked? Can you imagine all of those things in your life that maybe didn't seem possible suddenly seemed a little bit more real? Can you imagine what they would have thought about God? God probably never seemed bigger to them that day. See, God allows us to see him working in the world, and it changes us, and it reminds us how big God is and how awesome it is that we get to be part of what he's doing. You see, it's these things that God reminded me on my trip when I was in Haiti. So when I went down to Haiti, I had the opportunity to go down with my friends and just go to the places that they serve throughout the week. And so we spent a few days in some orphanages, and we spent two days in a clinic for malnourished kids, and then we just taught English with um, some college-age kids. And, you know, we really didn't do anything earth-shattering in our time there. While we were at the orphanage, we sang songs with kids, and we wiped noses, and we hugged them until they didn't want to be hugged anymore, and we told them that they were special, and we let them do crazy things with our hair so that we looked ridiculous by the time we left. And when we were at the clinic, all we did is we changed diapers, <laughs> certainly not a glamorous thing to do, and we fed babies bottles, and we changed bedding. And we just held these babies while they were burning up from fevers, and we just tried to pray over them because that's all we could really do to help. And when we were teaching college-age kids English, they actually already knew English pretty well, so I'm not entirely sure why we were there. But we just let them practice by asking them questions about who they are and what their life has been like, and by trying to share those things openly about our lives as well. And we just tried to learn their names and be encouraging to them. You see, we didn't feed any masses that any of those days with miraculous bread. But we did get to step into what God was doing in the world. And it was special. And it mattered. And it didn't just matter to the people that we were serving. It mattered to us. Because even though we didn't see anything miraculous, we did get to see God doing special things in the world. And we got to see the world being restored one smile one well-fed baby, one handshake at a time. And that was a gift for my soul, you know? That was just something that satisfied me and reminded me how awesome my God is and reminded me how cool it is that I get to spend my life being part of this restoration mission that God has for the world. So when I got back from Haiti, my friend Courtney, um, who I was visiting, she posted this on her blog. I wanted to share it with you guys. She says, love makes me hold fast. I hold fast to the sick, malnourished babies I hold each weekend at the clinic. 
I hold fast to the reality that when I don't feel adequate or ready to teach English, I can be used to help equip my students with something that can help them find a job. I hold fast to what I feel God preparing me to do in one orphanage in Lisbon, and I hold fast to the hope that Jesus will act and come forth for the children in the other orphanage I've been involved with. I hold fast to all the beautiful relationships God has formed for me here, for the mom that now lives with me, for a motorcycle driver that now comes to church with me, for students that challenge me, and for children that bless and change me, and for friends who I find deep encouragement and gladness in. When I remember everything God has done and keeps doing, even the most hopeless and unlikely of situations becomes something that I can trust God to restore. You see, the gift of service is that we get these moments to remember what God has done. And when your life gets hard, and when following Jesus gets hard, because it is really hard, then it's good to have these moments that we can look to and say, ah, but remember when God, but remember when God, but remember when God. Because it's those moments, it's those gifts of those moments that give us the courage to believe that God really can take what is impossible and make a way. And so while you're talking about service and while you're serving other people, I would just encourage you, do it with your eyes open. Don't just focus on what you're doing, but focus on what God is trying to teach you in those moments. Ask him to be present with you. Ask him to show more of himself to you in those moments. And reflect on this idea that in that moment while you are serving, you get to be part of something that is bigger than yourself. So the next time you serve someone, no matter how big what you're doing is or how small it is, know that you are part of God's mission of restoration for the world. And that you are being given a front row seat to a God that is mending a world that's been broken. And all you have to do is just open your eyes and ask him to show you. Um, so is it okay if I just pray for you guys? And I will just pray that you are able to kind of do some of those things while you serve, okay? Dear God, I just thank you so much for these kids. I thank you for each one in this auditorium, God. I thank you that you have intended for each one of them to be game changers in this world, God. I thank you that you have made them each with special gifts, you've made them with special personalities, and you want to use them in your restoration mission for the world. And God, I ask that you would just pull them into the things that they're passionate about and that they would find ways to be able to use those things for you. And God, I ask that as they're doing those things, God, I ask that they would just serve with their eyes open and that they would see you and they would get to have these special moments with you they would understand more of what you're trying to do in the world and how you can use them in that. God, I just ask that you would bless them as they go about their day, and I ask that you would just use them in this world for great things. And I pray this in your name. Amen.